Okay, uh, this is Professor Azizur Rahman. Let's take this quiz and see how well we have performed. The first question is, if 45 years old had his routine blood sugar done after 8 hours of fasting, and it turned out to be 120 mg per deciliter, what would you label him as? Normal? pre-diabetes or he has diabetes mellitus according to the criteria. I think most would agree that it is pre-diabetes because normal sugar is less than 100 and diabetes is more than 126 and this one falls between these two uh, figures so this would be classified as pre-diabetes now pre-diabetes is actually diabetes in the making so i think uh, he should be told this patient must be told that this is not normal and soon he or she is going to develop diabetes and something must be done and that something should be i think lifestyle changes and if considered appropriate and if patient accepts that why may be metformin also. Next question now. If 45 years old had his routine HbA1c done in a non-fasting state and it turned out to be 6.5%, what would you label him as? Normal? pre-diabetes or diabetes mellitus. It is actually the same case scenario, but this is regarding HbA1c and the value is 6.5%. What do you think? This is of course a different person. Yes, I think technically he has developed diabetes because HbA1c is generally considered to be a very accurate test and just one test is good enough to make a final judgment uh, provided this test comes from a good laboratory and 6.5% or anything above that is enough to call somebody an individual with diabetes. So I think the correct answer is diabetes mellitus. Now let's take another one. Which of the following is not a known side effect of SGLT2 inhibitors? S SGLT2 inhibitors are uh, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors like empagliflozin, dapagliflozin. So the responses listed here are urinary tract infection, hypotension, polyuria, dehydration and pancreatitis which one is not a known side effect yes pancreatitis is the correct answer because urinary tract infection particularly in women and vulvovaginitis is well known side effect hypotension and polyuria, of course, it causes polyuria, somebody already having low blood pressure or maybe blood pressure lowering therapies could develop hypertension. Of course, dehydration also is possible if patient is not taking sufficient water. But pancreatitis is associated with some other anti-diabetic agents, not with SGLT2 inhibitors to the best of my knowledge. So I would consider pancreatitis as a correct answer to this question. Next one now, which of the following is a contraindication for the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists? I'm sure you know what are these GLP-1 receptor agonists. These are like liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide. And there are some class features. So based on those, which one you think is correct answer? Coronary artery disease, heart failure, 
pancreatitis, estimated GFR of less than 60 milliliter per minute, and gastritis. Now, I am referring to actually a joint statement given by American Diabetes Association and European uh, Association of Study of Diabetes consensus statement. Uh, according to that, which one you think is a contraindication for the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists? And most would agree. I think other societies uh, would also agree with the answer. So which one is a contraindication? Pancreatitis. One of the side effects reported in different trials is pancreatitis. Although pancreatitis is a rare complication of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy, but since pancreatitis is otherwise also relatively commoner in diabetic patients, and we don't want even a rare side effect to develop, so I think in all newer patients, you could use GLP-1 receptor agonists and of course will watch for any pancreatitis, but those who have already suffered from pancreatitis, particularly uh, if they had used GLP receptor agonists earlier and they developed pancreatitis due to GLP-1 receptor agonists, then of course this drug should be contraindicated. Even if there is history of pancreatitis due to some other cause, I guess GLP-1 receptor agonist should be avoided. All others are okay and you could use actually coronary artery disease is actually an indication. Uh, heart failure is also an indication. EGFR of less than 60 is okay. A GLP receptor agonist can be used with EGFR of as low as 15. Gastritis is of course no concern as this medicine is going to be given subcutaneously. Uh, these drugs that do cause little nausea but gastritis would not constitute a contraindication. Next move on to the next question. Which of the following medicine is most likely to cause hypoglycemia? Metformin, glabinclamide, liraglutide or cetagliptin? I think this should be very very obvious. So let's save time and move on to the correct answer. Glabinclamide. Of these four agents, metformin, liraglutide, and cetagliptin, they are known not to cause hypoglycemia because they do not stimulate beta cells. Glabinclamide, being a slightly old-fashioned sulfonylurea, they actually this drug stimulate uh, beta cell to produce more and more insulin even if your blood glucose level is normal. So it is likely to cause hypoglycemia, especially if patient has not eaten. The newer generation sulfonylureas, they are less likely to cause hypoglycemia, but they, they can also do the same. So I think uh, correct answer without any doubt is glabinclamide. Moving to the next slide now. Which of the following medicine is least likely to cause weight gain? You know, weight gain is always our concern. Type 2 diabetic patients are already overweight and we do not want to add further to their weight because weight adds many other issues like blood pressure, cholesterol, uric acid, joint problem and worsening of diabetes, of course. So any anti-diabetic drug which does not cause weight gain is generally preferred over those which cause weight gain. So which one of these is least likely to cause weight gain? Glimepride, dapagliflozin, insulin or repaglinide? Repaglinide is something very similar to sulfonylurea. So which of these is least likely to cause weight gain? It is dapagliflozin because dapagliflozin causes glycosuria. 
due to glycosuria patient would be losing some calories and it will help to reduce weight it would not necessarily cause weight loss because it depends on how much food patient is consuming if patient is counseled about restricting food intake and patient is also doing exercise so dapagliflozin can actually help to lose some weight it should not cause weight gain uh, although uh, i understand whatever is causing calorie loss from your body would probably stimulate your appetite so unless you are checking your food intake it might not cause weight loss because you are consuming the calories but uh, if patient is controlling one's diet also then i think it should cause weight loss but certainly not weight gain so let's now move on to the next slide which of the following is not a recommended combination uh, in diabetes we often use two drug combination three drug combination and sometimes even more than three when it's more than three then one of them has to be injectable and i have just listed four combinations and you have to tell me which one is not a recommended uh, or at least there is no rationale behind this combination metformin and glibenclamide metformin and pioglitazone sitagliptin and liraglutide insulin and metformin which of these you think is not a logical combination sitagliptin and liraglutide sitagliptin is dpp4 inhibitor and by inhibiting dpp4 it is going to preserve our own limited quantity of glp1 but when we use liraglutide it is glp1 analog and it would provide uh, the the same effect maybe 10 times more because we use it in in pharmacological dose so once somebody is on liraglutide or any other glp1 receptor agonist then the effect of sitagliptin would not be appreciated at all so giving sitagliptin would be unnecessarily increasing the pill burden and increasing the cost of the treatment whereas there would be perhaps no additional benefit so i think this combination is illogical once you start liraglutide and if patient is on uh, sitagliptin or any other dp4 inhibitors that should be withdrawn next question now what would be a reasonable goal of hba1c in a newly diagnosed diabetic patient with no associated comorbidities 5.7 or less less than 5.7 which means we would, would like to bring his a1c to normal because anything less than 5.5 5.7 is normal or less than 6.5% less than 7% or less than 8% where would you put your money newly diagnosed patient with no associated comorbidities the correct answer is 6.5 now let me clarify one point generally it is considered that once you are a diabetic our aim is to bring their hb1c to less than 7 that is a general rule so if you had answered this one probably i would have accepted that also as correct answer but it is also emphasized that those patients who are relatively newly diagnosed they are likely to be younger they are likely not to have any other comorbidities and they are less prone to develop hypoglycemia and they can tolerate hypoglycemia better also so and they have a longer life ahead so i think our aim should be to get their a1c to a better level of course ideal would be less than 5.7% and these days it is possible uh, to do that also but that would be possible only if patient is highly motivated and is very very 
compliant uh, because that is not often the case so i would think that in these patients our aim should be to bring their hb1c to less than 6.5 percent that is a reasonable i said reasonable goal ideal goal would be perhaps less than 5.7 percent but a reasonable goal would be 6.5 percent or less because that way they will uh, have fewer chances of developing complication of diabetes in future next one now which one of the following is the key abnormality in type 1 diabetes mellitus in increase insulin resistance increase hepatic glucose production or reduced insulin level out of the three which is the key abnormality and we are talking about type 1 diabetes mellitus okay i think reduced insulin level everybody knows that type 1 diabetes mostly because of some autoimmune phenomenon beta cells are damaged and beta cells are almost completely damaged there may be very very small number of cells surviving uh, this is a massive beta cell loss and these people they have insulin deficiency and that is why uh, they are going to diabetic ketoacidosis and that is why we need to put them on insulin right from the beginning so this is the key abnormality and this is not true when we talk about type 2 diabetes let's move on to the next question now what is not true about metformin right it is a drug of first choice in type 2 diabetes mellitus generally agreed uh, i mean generally considered to be the first line it is contraindicated in patients with diabetes and egfr less than 30 milliliter egfr is estimated glomerular filtration rate and 5 to 10 percent patient it may cause gastrointestinal upset which could be dyspepsia nausea bloating pain diarrhea it is notorious to cause hypoglycemia and it is incredibly cheap and effective drug which of these five statements is not true about metformin it is notorious to cause hypoglycemia is certainly not true metformin alone should not cause hypoglycemia unless it is prescribed to those who are otherwise prone to develop hypoglycemia somebody with kidney disease and liver disease and these are generally advanced kidney disease and advanced liver disease are generally considered to be contraindication or in an extremely uh, severe uh, unusual situation where patient has taken metformin and has not eaten for maybe 24 hours perhaps it can cause hypoglycemia but generally uh, if somebody maintains his normal eating pattern and is, does not have any severe liver or kidney disease or malabsorption thing like that uh, metformin alone does not cause hypoglycemia that was all this is professor aziz rahman from medistand i hope you enjoyed this uh, quiz video and i'm going to see you very soon in my next series of lectures which will be the part two of diabetes in early first part we discussed some basic concepts and soon i'm going to release part two which will cover some other aspects of diabetes mellitus thank you very much